Welcome back to Coffee and Conversation. I'm delighted to have my friend, Representative Nick Bain, on the show today. He's from Corinth, Mississippi, and he is chairman of the Judiciary B Committee, and he's been a champion of criminal justice reform in the Mississippi House. So welcome to the conversation. Yeah, thank you, Grant. So this year, you and a handful of other chairmen led the charge to pass Senate Bill 2123, the Mississippi Correctional Safety and Rehabilitation Act. That bill was ultimately vetoed by Governor Reeves, but tell us about that bill and why you supported it. Now, what the bill did ultimately was expand parole eligibility for certain offenders throughout the correctional, uh, the corrections uh, institutions in our state. And, and what we aim to do was to, to try to alleviate some of the burdens uh, of our prison industries. As you know, and as many people know, we are facing a Department of Justice investigation uh, who is looking at us very seriously on, on our climate in our prison uh, system. So uh, the bill basically aimed to try to alleviate some of that pressure and to do some of the stuff that DOJ is asking us to do. So one of the issues I know it was trying to address was this patchwork created by changes to the law that apply differently based on when a person was convicted. Um, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that's exactly right. Like in 95, the laws changed. Uh, so you had some, some people who were convicted of, of life that could get out uh, and within 10 years, uh, if they were if they were convicted before a certain time, and then if they were convicted after a time, life meant life, or it meant at the age of 65. So yes, you're exactly right. There's a patchwork. There's a hodgepodge of of different offenders throughout the system. Uh, somebody who was convicted of a crime in 2015 is treated differently than somebody who was convicted maybe in 1995. So. Uh, that's some of the, the issues that the Department of Justice has. That's some of the issues that uh, I think are constitutionally uh, uh, wrong with the way that we've done things. You know, there was a big push throughout the middle 90s, with, really with the Clinton administration throughout the whole country uh, on this tough on crime, truth and sentencing type of legislation. And that's something that Mississippi's paying a price for right now. So this bill also excluded some of the worst offenses, right? That's right. It did. Sex offenders excluded some of the some of your uh, uh, murders, uh, violent offenders. Some of those were uh, excluded. Now I want to be. I want to. I want a little nuance for a little bit. Violent offenders in Mississippi is is. You know, we think of violent offenders as murderers, as rapists, but we have a, a definition of violent offenders that also includes things like, uh, like a simple burglary or something to that effect. We have a, a violent offender is a is a term of art, I guess, in a legal community. So, uh, I say that to say that even though they may be classified as violent offenders, their actual crime may not have been violent in nature, if that makes sense. It does. Well, and uh, I think it's important to remember this bill didn't let anybody out. Uh, it's no, simply, not at all. It simply let our parole board do the job task of them, right? That's exactly right. Everything went to the parole board. It expanded parole eligibility. Uh, and, and that's the biggest thing that I think got lost in all of this. People uh, with the scare tactics and some of the misnomers, people thought we were letting people out. That's absolutely false. We were expanding parole eligibility to people, giving uh, giving the pro board who is appointed by the governor uh, the complete authority on whether these individuals should get out or not. I've, as a practicing attorney, I've had a gentleman who was convicted of murder in the early 80s, uh, and I've taken him before the pro board three times, and he's been denied every time because uh, the pro board just didn't feel like it was right. So it's, it's very difficult. And I, and I can't remember the percentage, but it's less than 10% of those type of individuals that are getting paroled. So you mentioned the Department of Justice is investigating our prison system. Um, you know, this gives us a window of time where we can actually uh, still control the outcome of this and we can make changes ourselves, or else they're going to make demands of us, right? That's exactly right. And, and, and you know, they're going to do what 2123 basically did or, or tell us that that's what it's going to do. And then the biggest thing that it's going to cost us taxpayers in Mississippi a whole lot of money uh, with fighting a lawsuit uh, and 
potentially we as legislators, as the legislative body, we're going to lose our appropriation uh, ability. I mean, they're going to come in and say, you're going to have to spend this amount of money on corrections. You're going to have to spend this amount of money fixing the problem. That's what happened in Alabama. I know you had Senator uh, Cam Ward on, on recently, and he talked about talked about those very same things, that they – there is no if months about it. They came down and they told Alabama what to do, and they're going to tell Mississippi what to do. It's still in our hands, and that that is by far uh, a blessing at this point. We can do something about it without having to uh, answer to a federal judge. So what was the appetite for this bill in the House? And now that it's been vetoed, Sort of where do we go? Uh, where do we go from here? We're actually having a, a hearing next week on this issue, uh, getting some of the players and some of the powers that be for the various organizations, the prosecutors, the sheriffs, uh, and getting them in the room to talk about it. To say, hey, look, where where are you at? Is there middle ground to meet on this? Uh, and tell them what we're looking at as a legislature. You know, nobody in the legislature wants to be deemed as soft on crime, and I think that's really. Uh, the, the guiding issue here. So we want to come together with all those people involved. Uh, you know, the governor in his veto message told us he wanted to talk about it. We've sent a letter to him. We've asked him to say, hey, send some of your people to our hearing. Give us an idea. Where are you at? What's going to get you to the point to where you're not going to veto this? Uh, so I hope that the appetite is a realization that the Department of Justice is not going to go away, and we as legislators can't be myopic enough uh, to just let this happen. So zooming out a little bit, um, Mississippi is the second highest incarcerated state in the nation. Um, this is something that we've struggled with as a state. What do you think is the root issue here in Mississippi? Why do we have such a large prison population? Yeah, we had a mindset that we need to put people in prison instead of actually giving them the help they need. You know, as a practicing attorney, one of the most beneficial things that I've seen has been drug courts and, the, and, and things of their ilk like that, that, that have allowed for people to be rehabbed. And, uh, and it's really, Grant, it's, a, it's addition by subtraction. If we can get those people who have a, a substance abuse problem, who have some issue, we can get them the help they need, uh, then we can concentrate on really the bad guys and, and putting the people who need to be in prison in prison. And we're not, um, we're not unique to this. When you look at other states, Texas, Oklahoma, some really conservative states, they have gone down this path of greatly reducing their prison population while at the same time, crime has not gone up. In fact, it's gone down because I think there's a recognition that when you sure right-size the criminal criminal justice system and you you get rid of some of these overly harsh sentences and at the same time you put in re-entry and rehabilitation programs you actually help people uh earn their earn a path to a second chance right that's right and and that's what 2123 hopefully wanted to do and and uh chairman horan uh, who's chairman of corrections he was he said this on the floor uh giving people hope, giving those that are in prison hope, giving those that have some type of abuse problem, some type of hope that they're going to A, uh, have a chance of getting out, or B, have a chance of getting better, that increases the morale in your prisons, that increases uh, uh, the overall environment there. You know, Burl Kane has made a, a commitment that uh, – uh, 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 having a religious, having a Bible study, having whatever creates a better environment. And that's exactly what you're saying is if you can provide people with that hope, it makes things uh, better all the way around. So why is this something that conservative Republicans should care about? You know, a lot of times we hear voices that are Democrats um, talking about this issue or, or far left organizations talking about this. But in Mississippi, we're seeing a lot of the conservative groups talk about it. So why do you think Republicans care about this? Well, I think so because of, number one, it, the, the burden that it, that it potentially could be on taxpayers if we had to fight a billion-dollar lawsuit. Uh, but number two, I think it's just a moral issue. I, I really do, of, of helping people who need help. Uh, you know, most of our prison is, is population is, is drug, drug offenders, people who have a drug abuse problem. 
uh, and, and, and in some sense, an alcohol abuse problem. So it's, it's helping people. It's a moral issue. And if we can get those people out, get them uh, the help they need, and hopefully uh, get them out of society, back to work, uh, that, in, that increases our overall way of life in Mississippi. It increases our overall uh, just population and the ability to sell Mississippi. So I think it's a, it's, it's the, uh, I think it is a conservative issue. Uh, and, and that's been proven. Phil Bryant, who nobody would argue with his, his purity as a conservative, uh, really uh, took this bull by the horn his last term in gov- as governor and, and made it an issue of his. No doubt. So as you look out over the next couple of years as chairman of Judiciary B, what are some of the other things that you think need to happen in this criminal justice reform space? Yeah, I, I, I think we need to, uh, again, have the discussion on where we can find the middle ground with 2123 and, and move forward with that. I also think uh, a personal one of mine is, uh, is I'd like to look at a habitual offender statute. That was a bill that we had this year that I thought was a good bill. But like I said, um, we decided to, uh, we decided to, to, to just proceed with 2123 and, and uh, get it through. Uh, so the, uh, and for your listeners or whoever, the habitual offender statute is basically the three strikes law. I'd like to, I'd like to tweak that a little bit to where, uh, again, we're putting violent offenders, we're putting people who, who need to be in prison in prison and not having someone serve life uh, for a possession of marijuana or something like that. So that's, I think, something we need to address along with some just some little other issues uh, with uh, maybe some of the administrations of MDOC and stuff like that. But uh, first things first is is getting 2123 or it's it's a prodigy that comes off of it it a a uh, to a place to where everybody can agree and we can make it law. Mm. Well, I appreciate your leadership on this issue. We will be looking uh, forward to seeing what comes out of the hearing next week in the House. And uh, thank you for joining our conversation. We'll continue to hear from you in the future. Yeah, thank you, Grant, for having me. And, And hopefully we can move Mississippi forward on this.